the causal models and we looked at a specific type of a causal model. We looked at uh, structural causal models. So what was this again? We had a set of so-called structural equations. So if you're interested in, let's say, three random variables, then one example <coughs> may look like this. So you have a random variable x is a function of y, y is a function of z. And then you have z, which may just be noise. OK, so and we have seen that because of this acyclic structure, it was quite easy to see <coughs> that whenever you have a structural causal model like this, this induces a joint distribution. So let's call this the observational distribution. And at the same time, this also induces a graph. This was very easy because here we just draw edges from variables that appear on the right-hand side to variables on the left-hand side. So here we have uh, z, it's just a chain, right? z is causing y, and y is causing x. So this is the corresponding graph here. So we have discussed a lot in the first part how to also compute interventional distributions out of the structural causal model. And we have looked at the adjustment formula and so on. The question of causal discovery, this was the second part of the mini course. This is concerning the question, well, can we actually learn the causal structure from data? And therefore, we looked at the very first idea. So there, um, we try to, this is the sort of the problem setup. We are trying to reconstruct the structure from, let's say, only the observational distribution. Okay, so we are given the observational distribution. We are trying to find the corresponding graph. So uh, I will say like one more minute about this method um, again. But re if you remind yourself, so the idea was to say, well, we are given the observational distribution, and we are so we're sort of focusing on the graph, right? So we're trying to recover the graph structure. Whereas today, we will see methods that focus a bit more on the structural causal model. So again, we are given data. So in an infinite um, setting, you can uh, think of like receiving the observational distribution. But then we will focus a bit more on sort of trying to recover the structural causal model uh, rather than just the graph structure. OK. So what was the first idea that we looked at? So um, these independence-based methods, what they do is they establish a link between the distribution and the graph. And they're doing this by saying, well, we have, by basically assuming um, the Markov condition and the faithfulness condition. And if you assume these two assumptions, if you assume these two conditions, then you have to run a one to one correspondence between deseparation statements in the graph and condition independent statements in the observational distribution. And uh, these you could exploit. So the overall idea was to say, well, we are just looking for all condition dependencies in our data, in our observation distribution. We know, because of these assumptions, we know that they correspond to these separation statements. And then we, in a somewhat clever way, have to try to reconstruct uh, the corresponding graphs. And what I said earlier, as well as that, um, it's a bit unfortunate because in some situations we can never distinguish graphs that have the same deseparation statements, right? So these were the graphs that we called Markov equivalent, and this is especially true in the case of two variables. So if you only, if you only have two random variables, then in this graph there is no deseparation statement that holds, right? Everything is connected. So you know that this one is Markov equivalent to the graph with the inverted edge, so to this graph. And therefore, these independence-based methods, they will never work in a sense for a bi in the bivariate case for just two random variables. And this is a sort of starting point that we are looking at right now. Any questions about this? One minute recap. Good. So then the question is, what do we do then? if we only have two random variables. Is there anything uh, uh, that we can do? So we have seen that these independence-based methods, they fail here. And in a way, this is a particularly difficult case. And I want to argue now why, why this is so. If you look at the structural causal model, so if this is our starting point, then again, we have an impossibility um, uh, result there. And it goes as follows. So let's formulate this as a small proposition. So if you are given a joint distribution over x and y, you can always find a structural causal model, for example, with a graph x causing y, that explains exactly this distribution. Okay, so I'm writing this down. 
So for all joint distributions P over X and Y, there exists a structure called the model. So let's make it easy. So we say there exists a function F and some noise and Y such that Y equals F of X comma and Y and and y is independent of x. In a way, this is a bad result. So what does it say? It says whenever you have a distribution that comes from any structural causal model, no matter what it is, then you can always find a, a structural causal model that corresponds to x causing y. Right? So if you want to make it even, even clearer, you can say, well, this of course also means that there exists a function g and some noise mx such that x is a function of y and mx, and this mx is independent of y. Right? So this is a negative result because it says, well, no matter what you have, you can always find, so you can always explain this distribution by x causing y or y causing x. Do you have an idea how to prove this? So it's maybe hard to see. Um, if you think about it a bit with a pen, of, a pen and paper, it won't take a lot of time. So one idea to do it is as follows. So this noise you choose to be uniform. And for this function here, what you can do is you can look at the conditional distribution x given y, look at the CDF, and invert it. So I'm not writing it down formally, but this is really the, the idea. So here for you look at the inverse CDF of in this case, y given the uh, x given y. So this this usual trick, right? So if you um, plug in a uniform distribution there, then you get out the uh, into the inverse CDF, you get out the uh, correct distribution. Okay, then the details here don't matter. In a way, this is a complicated. Uh, this is a negative result. But what is now important to realize is that if you think a bit about this, it turns out that indeed you can do this, but these functions that you have to use, they are super complicated. So in, in some sense, if you have a sort of irregularity assumption, we will see that this, this result does not hold anymore. And the intuition is that indeed you can do this, but only to the price to allow for very complicated functions g and f, and possibly this, this relation between the noise and the input can be very complicated as well. OK? So this is. The negative result, and now we see a positive result. So the, f the second idea that I would like to discuss in this scheme of causal discovery of uh, structural learning is what we, what we sometimes call restricted structural causal models. So there the idea will be to say, OK, this is in a very bad result, but this is also uh, sort of in a way adversarial. So let's try to see whether we can do anything if we assume that these functions that appear in our structural causal model are easy, if they have a simple form. And we will see, indeed, then something is possible. And this is the first result. So assume, for example, that you have a linear model. So y is a linear function of x plus some noise. And again, the noise and the input are uh, independent. And then it turns out that you have this result. So if the noise and the x are not jointly Gaussian, then you get identifiability. So what does it mean? So in this case, there is no backward model. So if you start with a model like this, then you can recover the structure because there's no way of writing x as a linear function y plus some noise. This I would like to discuss why this is the case and possibly provide a bit of an intuition. Does this uh, sort of result remind you of anything that you may have seen before? So uh, sometimes. This rings the bell. This is very closely related to um, independent component analysis. There you're also assuming non-Gaussianity in order to re re gain some identifiability. OK, so the statement hopefully is clear. If we start with this uh, linear model, and if we sort of uh, forbid the Gaussian case, then we have identifiability, meaning then we, account we cannot write the model in the opposite direction. So why is this the case? So let's look at an example. So I just plug in now concrete uh, values for the functions. So let's say it's a function 2 times x. And let's say the, the variables have a uniform distribution, which is certainly not Gaussian. So then what I can do is I can plot, uh, I can simulate some data. Um, so what do I do here? This is uh, x. 
So I simulate from x, it's a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Then I plug the value of x, I plug it through this function, through the red line, and then I add some uniform noise to it. So this is a scatter plot that you would get if you um, obtain a sample from this underlying distribution. Now the statement is, we cannot write this as a linear function uh, from y to x plus some noise. So we cannot write x as a linear function y plus some independent noise. And why is this the case? So your y is actually a summation of two uniform. It's a triangular distribution. So it's like if you now have to kind of find out in another noise process that you have to add to the triangular to basically get a uniform out. So uh, yes, that's a that's a nice argument, uh, and it works. So you're arguing now with the uh, with the shape of the marginal distribution of y. Um, this works, but it's uh, at least not too clear to me right now how this argument would generalize. So this is a, certainly a correct argument in this case, but then the statement holds even for uh, non-uniform uh, distributions, right? It holds for all distributions that are non-Gaussian. Um, but it's a valid argument, I think. So a general way to see this is, I mean, what would be nice to do is uh, sort of to <coughs> turn the laptop, but I think this doesn't help to turn the screen, so you may have to turn your head around. So what you do is you turn your head by 90 degrees, and then you're looking at x as a function of y. Okay, so we have to try to explain x as a function of y as a linear one. And I mean, this is a data set, so we can just try it, right? So what do you do? We just fit uh, a linear model for x using the input y. So we can do this, and I've done it for you, so this is the function that you get. So we are trying now to explain x with a value of y. So this is the function that you get. So, but why is this not a valid backward model? Yeah? And why then the support, the, the, the length of the support is not constant. Exactly. So the a, a different way of phrasing this is to say, if you now do this, the residuals are not independent of the input anymore. And you see this, for example, by your argument by saying that the support changes. So if you look at this value here uh, of y, then what you see is that here the support of the residuals is actually very different from the support over here, right? But it should be independent. So I go back to the, to the original model that we are, we are looking for. So we are looking for an explanation of x using y with an independent noise. And this is not the case anymore. So this is the backward model. This is the best, sort of it's the least square fit. But this is one of the uh, possible backward models that we may, have, may look at. And now if you look at the residuals, so this is what I'm now plotting is, I'm just plotting the residuals here. What you see is that here, for example, they are um, a bit positive. Here they are uh, negative. So what you see is that now suddenly these residuals really depend on y. And this should not be the case, right? So if you have x function of y, plus some noise mx, then the residuals should be independent of y. But here you see it's not the case anymore. So you have a very strong dependence between the residuals from the fit x to y and y. Does this make sense? Yeah? Do you think that this is really an argument? I mean, the fact that you can uh, preclude this Gaussian is that argument about Fourier transform, right? Like the, the central mean theorem tells you that like, Gaussian distributions are the only ones that are solutions to this fixed point, like when you start multiplying a bunch of, of Fourier transforms together, right? And, and, and here it's really a question about convolution, right? So here you're saying only the Gaussians will allow me to have the right thing when I start making those convolutions, but if I start allowing myself to make even a minor transformation of one of those, those variables, right? If I make x is, say, y squared plus something, then this is not happening anymore. We will see both of these uh, questions. Uh, we will see later okay. if that's okay. <clears throat> yeah. So this is an this is an, uh, sort of an intuition. Or let one example. But the, your I mean your idea is correct. It uh, points in the right direction. But this is again. I'm just showing this. So this is an example uh, that hopefully sort of shows that in this example the statement is correct, right? So this certainly is a model from x to y, but if you want to now explain x using y, so if you look at the backward direction, then it's not really, it's, I mean, you can say it's a reasonable fit, but the problem is that here the noise 
is sort of independent, not independent of the input anymore. Okay, so this suggests this uh, this argument suggests a meta method what to do in practice. So can you guess that? So let's assume now we have some data set like this, but we don't have the we don't know whether like x is causing y or y is causing x. So we just receive data. And then the question is, how can we find out? So if we assume that indeed the underlying model is a linear function plus some non-Gaussian noise, how can we find this, recover this model? We're now just giving data, and we want to see is x causing y or y causing x. We can both regressions and we do an independent test on the residuals. Yes, that's very easy, no? So what you do is, you just if you don't know the truth, you're just trying out both models. <coughs> so let me write this down. So first, you do regress y on x and check independence uh, between residuals and x. And then the second one is the, the other direction. So you're doing the same thing. Now you regress x on y. And again, check the independence <laughs> between residuals and y. And then you decide. So I mean, I, I can show you this is super simple. Maybe I'm stating the obvious here. But I can just show you that this is really indeed simple. So this small advertisement. So we have a couple of these code snippets in our book. So you can just copy some of those. So what, I'm, what am I doing here? I'm generating a data set. So here, the indeed, again, y is a, uh, the y is in this case a nonlinear function of some noise. So we will see that the same sort of argument holds in the nonlinear case um, as well. Uh, so we will see this in the second. Um, but here we are doing the same trick. So here we will run a nonlinear regression set of a linear regression sort of the same argument if you're in the linear case and then have non-Gaussian noise. And then what do you do? And this is the, the line that I wanted to show you. So what you're doing is you're just fitting a model from, let's say, y on x. And then what you're doing is you're checking the independence between the residuals and the input. So this is what's stated here. So this is the model forward residuals. You check whether there's a dependence between these residuals and the input. And what you will find here that indeed is in the comment. So here you will have a very large p-value of the independence test. I will say a couple of words about this in a second. You have a very large p-value. This means, OK, they, it seems to be that there's indeed an independence in one direction, whereas if you do it in the other direction, you get a very small p-value. This suggests, ah, there probably is a dependence between the residuals and the input. Hopefully, this is not too confusing. It's now in a nonlinear regression, but it works exactly the same as uh, in the linear linear case. So there are many sets for independence. Why do you pick this one? Yes. So why do I pick this one? And this is um, which requires its own library. <laughs> this is this is a uh, this is a good question, and hopefully it becomes a bit clear. If you now, I mean, very quickly, I would like to say a word about the theory. So why does this work? We have, we have seen this in an example, and we have tried. I've tried to argue this example that the statement really holds. But how do you prove the underlying theorem? And where does the Gaussianity come into play? Because this um, gives us a hint about which kind of independence test to use. So what is the statement? I just write it down again. So the statement is as follows. So we are saying, if you have a linear model, then we can invert it if and only if you have a Gaussian distribution. So assume we have y equals alpha times x plus some ny. And then our statement is as follows. So there exists a backward model. This means there exists a beta and some noise mx, such that x equals beta times y plus some mx, if and only if x and ny are Gaussian. This is the same statement. And where does this come from? So how do we prove this? This, this uh, contains two directions, right? So let's first look at the, uh, the easy direction. So this is the proof. Let's first look at this case. 
So if you have Gaussianity, then we can actually invert it. So do you have a nice argument for this? So why can we invert it, uh, the model in the Gaussian case? Yeah, of course, many different arguments. Write it here, it's easier to read. But one way to look at it is, is just to um, sort of say, okay, let's try to find the correct model by just linear regression. So what you can do is, if you look at these variables in L2, so what we are now doing is we are drawing these random variables as vectors and the dot product will be the covariance. So how does this model look like? So we are, we are saying y is a function is alpha times x plus some noise. So we start with x. Let's say this is x. Then we have alpha times x. This is just a scaled version. This is alpha times x. And then we are obtaining y by adding some noise. Say this is our noise. So because the noise is independent of x, it should be orthogonal. So the covariance is zero. So then we obtain our y. This is our y. OK, so this is this model just written down in L2. So y equals alpha times x plus some noise. And here, there should be a, a covariance of 0. So now what happens if I want to find a model where I explain x from y? So how do I find this in this L2 space? Well, this is just linear regression. What I'm doing is I'm projecting x onto y. right? So what I'm doing is, this is what we do in linear regression. I'm just saying, well, if I do this, then what I can do is I can write x as a linear function of y. So let's call this beta y plus something that is certainly perpendicular, so that is uh, um, that satisfies that the covariance should be zero to y. Does this make sense? So this I can always do. This is linear regression, right? So the linear regression is just projection in L2. So what does it mean? I have now written x as a linear function of y plus something where the covariance is 0. Am I done now? Exactly. That's the argument that is missing. So because it's uncorrelated and we are in the uh, uncorrelated does not mean that it's independent, but because we are in the Gaussian setting, it does. Right? So this we can always do. But, and if you do this linear regression, this is well known, right? So you will always find that no matter what you do, as long as <laughs> including an intercept, so the residuals will always be uncorrelated to the input. But only in the Gaussian case, you can argue that they are also independent. And this gives a hint, this is what I meant, what kind of independence test you have to use for the method that I described earlier. Because we know by construction, the residuals will always be uncorrelated. But we, are, we have to test for independence. And this is why you need an independence test. There are many different choices. But you have to take one that is at least like going beyond the second moments. And this uh, thing that I used is something, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not claiming that this is optimal, but this is something that we found very useful uh, to use as a black box in many different settings. It's called uh, HSIC. It stands for <coughs> sorry, Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion. It's basically a kernel-based test. So that indeed had the, has the property that it finds like dependencies beyond the second moment. Is this argument clear for the Gaussian? Okay. Yeah. So is there a trade-off in the methods that we could do here? So for example, non-Gaussianity can be seen in fourth moment of you know from ICA, for example. So I could have an independence test that's essentially I mean, the question is, is there a way that I can have because independence is very hard to test. And so, especially if I want to have all alternatives against independence. But here, is there a trade-off? Because as soon as I'm so being epsilon away from non-Gaussianity probably requires me a very strong independent test. But if I know I'm going to be far away from in, from Gaussianity, can I get a weaker independence test that's using simpler, uh, low degree, uh, low moment, uh, small moments, or something like this? Um, okay, I didn't plan to do this, but uh, so maybe I say it will be very short. I say a couple of words about the other direction because I think this is the relation. How do you prove the other direction? So what happens if we are in the non-Gaussian case? So I'm not writing down the full proof, but what I'm doing is, which direction is it now? It's this one. What I'm doing is I'm stating the lemma that is basically including the whole theory. And this is a, a theorem from Damo and Skitovic. Theorem. 
And it goes as follows. So hopefully I do no mistake now. So what you do is you consider, you consider random variables, x1 to xd, and they are um, non-degenerate. Okay, so think about they have a density or something. Non-generate random variables, and they are independent. So now the statement goes as follows from this darmas gutovich theorem. Then, whenever you find two different linear combinations of these guys that are independent, then everything must be Gaussian. Okay? So then the following statement holds. So if there exists alpha j and beta j such that you have the linear combinations of these guys, they are independent, independent of beta j, x j. So then this implies everything is Gaussian. x1 to xd are all Gaussian. So what you can do as an exercise, if you like, in the bracket or so, this is basically really the only thing that you need to prove this, uh, this uh, other direction, this inverse direction. It's actually a one-liner. Yeah? Did I do a mistake? I, it looks like it. I mean, do you insist that all of them are non-zero? Yes. Then there exists non-zero. Non Thank you. I knew it. Yeah, that was a mistake. Yeah. They're all non-zero, right? Uh, yeah, you can relax this. Think of all of them being non-zero. But they are but yeah, yeah, so you can, you, what you want is the, you want an intersector. But it's a, I mean, you can make this more general, but non-zero is, is enough here. It's a bit of a surprising result, I would say. So this is one of these uh, characterizations of a Gaussian distribution that's quite interesting. The proof of this, of course, I mean, it's not surprising. You just look at characteristic functions. Uh, it's, an, I think, quite an interesting proof. Um, but this is the statement that we need, and if you play a bit around with these uh, two equations, then it's really a one-liner to use this result. So now, why am I saying this? Because this whole um, sort of this whole idea, it's called Lingam, which for several reasons is a very bad name, especially if you start Googling it. But this stands for linear non-Gaussian additive models. Okay, and this is an uh, this is something that uh, was developed by Shimizu et al. And they are looking at this problem, at this idea of identifiability, exactly from ICA. They are not coming from, so they're not writing a proof that looks like this, but they are like relaxing this problem, reducing the problem to ICA. And this is why, this is why I'm saying this. Um, they also develop a method that is exactly based on ICA that exactly does this. They look at fourth moments. If you think about the theory, it's not surprising maybe, so I had to check this because I didn't know. If you look how you prove ICA, it's exactly this theorem. So this theorem is at the basis of, of ICA, of the identifiability of ICA. So there are these uh, sort of two stories don't uh, contradict each other. But this is a slightly different uh, way of looking at it because this suggests, well, use any independence test, whereas if you're coming from ICA, you're looking at fourth moments. They checked it in practice. I wasn't involved in this. And they, um, it seems to be the case that um, uh, looking at independencies is actually more stable. So they, uh, they are claiming, so now sort of they are updating their methods. And they are saying, uh, basically, if you look at independencies, it's even better than basing it on ICA, as far as I know. Good. Any questions about this? So this is one idea that we can do. And of course, we are only in two variables. But I will say something about the multivariate case uh, later on. Uh, this is an, so, sort of this is now a some very small excursion, if you like. So this is an application that uh, I like. That's funny. It's a bit useless, though. I have to warn you. So the next three slides are a bit useless. But it tells you a bit what you can do with this. So this idea that you get identifiability in linear models if you have non-Gaussian uh, variables, this you can actually use for um, trying to detect the error of time. And what do I mean by this? So this is a, a, some very old work that, where we looked at linear time series. So basically, if you're familiar with AMA processes, you can look at this. Um, if you're not, maybe think about the MA part vanishing. So the Z, see the noise. And if you put this on the other side, then, then basically what you have is XT, T is the time index, is just a linear um, function of the preceding time steps plus some noise. OK, so this is the model that you can look at. And the statement is now that whenever you have such a time series model, it is time reversible. So it allows a, a, a time series in the um, inverse time direction if and only if the, no the noise is Gaussian. 
So this is an, if you like, interesting result because now what you can do is you can just look at time series and see whether you can, using this inference principle, you can actually um, recover the direction of time. And of course, in practice, this is not something you want to do because we're knowing the time that is going forward, right? But the point is, what we can now do is we have a lot of data where we have the ground truth because we know what the time direction is pointing at, and we can now test whether this inference principle of like looking at non-Gaussian noise, whether this is something sensible in practice or not. In time series, especially, you often you, you probably uh, know this better than I do, but I mean, uh, in, in many situations. You actually expect, like in the financial sector, for example, that the noise has much heavier tails than a Gaussian. So there, the Gaussianity is actually often a very bad assumption. We have done this a couple of years ago in the univariate case. And so recently, we looked at this in the multivariate case as well. And the reason is uh, uh, this article that was actually developed here. This is a group from Bill Freeman and et al. Um, they have looked at whether you can um, apply these ideas of detecting the time uh, direction in videos. And they applied uh, several methods, but uh, they also used sort of a multivariate version uh, of our result. And this is why at some point we wanted to extend the theory as well, because it's used in this work. So what do you do? You look at some videos. Let's see whether this is working now. No. So you look at some video, and then you want to infer whether it's going backwards or forwards. It. Yeah, so this, for example, you just look at a video, and then uh, here, I mean, for humans, it's quite easy to say whether something is uh, going forward or backward because you just uh, you have a lot of high level features, right? But for a computer, you can imagine that it's much harder so because you don't know anything about uh, how life works. So here, it's actually, uh, it turns out that maybe this case is not so easy as well, especially if you see these old ladies like walking backwards, uh, like very confident without looking back. And uh, here it turns out this is indeed a video that is showing uh, it's uh, showing backwards because, as you can imagine, this is a backward running competition, and uh, this happens, of course, in Great Britain. Where else would you find this? <laughs> it's still a very nice video, I think. But this is what you could uh, can do with this um, with this principle, this inference principle. I think they're pretty good. So I, I tried this once as well, but I'm not as fast as to say. But late, I mean, a bit funny that they all enter the goal at the same time, of course. <laughs> good. Oops, sorry. So this is how they would do it. I mean, this is one of the methods how you could apply it. You do some sort of a feature uh, detection in a, in a picture. So you register these features um, over the different frames. And then what you're doing is you're trying to fit a linear model to the velocities. And then you're seeing whether you can, these autoregressive models are reasonable fit for these velocities. And if they are, then you can try to detect the uh, direction of the video. Apparently, it worked uh, significantly. I mean, I'm not sure whether it worked in all cases, but this is one of the cases where it worked. Yeah. You can also do this, of course, with other time series. So again, this is the idea. So you have the uh, time series, the real world time series. Uh, so these are growth rates uh, of GDP for three different countries. And then you flip it in, in time, and then you are asking the computer, well, which one is the correct one? And again, it's a sort of a, in a way, it's a useless task, I would say, in practice. But we can use this in order to apply this inference principle of causal inference, right? And here, indeed, so this one is the correct uh, direction. This is something that is very hard to see with uh, a naked eye, I guess. But uh, for this inference principle, it works pretty <coughs> nicely. Good. So this is the, I mean, here we are looking at these very weird models, like these linear models and non-Gaussian noise. And of course, we don't expect anything in real life to satisfy a model that is close to this. Whereas, uh, for example, we would like to include some nonlinearity. This is something that I mentioned um, five minutes ago or so. I would like to motivate it with this, uh, this picture here. So this is a collection of data sets uh, that in Tübingen we tried to collect. Uh, so this is growing over time. So this is an old version. So there we have uh, about 80 or 90 uh, data pairs. And what you always see is this is real data. And each of these small figures is one scatter plot of a, um, of a real data set where one of the variables is the cause and the other one the effect. And they are sort of um, 
permuted, so sometimes the x-axis is the cause and sometimes the y-axis is the effect. And this is a very diverse collection. So some of these um, examples include availability of clean drinking water and child mortality rate and so on. So this is very diverse. So you have examples from physics, um, from the financial sector and so on. And what we always did is we tried to not cheat. So what we always did is whenever one of us had an idea for a data set, then everyone had to sort of uh, write uh, what he or she thinks is the correct cause and what the effect is. Uh, and only if all of us agreed, we included it in this data set. Of course, there's still, uh, there may still be a bias because we're all from the same lab, but we are really trying, we were trying to sort of create a data set with a known ground truth. So where most of the people would agree that indeed this is the cause and the effect. So the question is, can we do something? And I mean, you already see that most of these data sets are, um, are not linear. But I would like you to focus on one special example, and this is this one. So if you look at this example, um, so again, we can do a, a democracy game here. So you have now, if you would need to decide whether this is the cause or whether this is the cause. I would like you to sort of uh, take an opinion. So you now you have to decide, is this the cause and the effect, or is this the effect and this is the cause? Okay, so I'm not telling you any theory, just uh, use your gut feeling. So who is in favor of this being the cause? Okay, who is in favor of this being the cause? This is uh, surprising, no, that all of us agree. And I mean, this is a bivariate uh, setting. So there are only two variables. And I mean, even if you don't know anything about the statistics, then somehow you have the impression that this is the, should be the cause and this is the effect. Can any one of you express uh, his or her opinion? Yeah. It looks like y is a function of x. And this is especially uh, the case here because we have this uh, non-injectivity, right? So it's somehow, if we would like it, try to explain x as a function of y, this is a much more complicated model. It's a bit. Bimodal distribution. Say again. You would need a bimodal distribution. Yeah, and you would even need a di distribution that changes, no? A, a noise distribution that changes because for these values of y, you would have some noise distribution that is unimodal, but then at some point it becomes bimodal. And this is a bit funny, right? This seems to be a very complicated model. And this is sort of the starting point of this uh, second idea. And now you will see very similar pictures, but in a slightly different model class. We are, we are not linear anymore, but now we are going to nonlinear models. Yeah? There was some thoughts on the previous slide that looked jointly Gaussian, roughly. Like, maybe over there. Here? Yeah. Oh, no, more like now. Uh, right? Yeah, those, I guess. Uh, yeah. Is so, it surprising that all of you agree that one is the cause, one is the Ah, we are not, sorry, we didn't agree by looking at the data. We looked at the, sorry, yeah, I should have said this. the data ends up looking like this. Yeah, but that's, that's how it is now. I mean, that's bad for us, maybe. Like, so it's a linear. Height of father, height of son, right? And <laughs> that's going to look exactly like this. Yeah. Could be, yeah. So I mean, we, we only looked at the explanation of the data. So we said, OK, availability of clean drinking water and child mortality rate, hopefully there's only like a causal link in one direction. I mean, I don't know what, <laughs> where the water comes from. But I mean, this is, these are the cases where sort of you, you hope that, I mean, all of, you, all of us agreed on the direction of the causal link. And also, and, but this is where the sort of the trade-off comes in. Um, we try to include cases that are not super strongly confounded. Some of them are, certainly. But then if you are ending up with it, I'm not sure I should, uh, I should have a look at this particular example. But if it's really the case that this is jointly Gaussian, it's sometimes hard to see, right, because this is a, not a good plot. But if this really turns out to be a jointly Gaussian distribution, then uh, we cannot do anything about it, right? I'm, with our methods. Maybe some other person has an, a different idea, and then you can solve this. But I mean, in a way, then that's life. So we have to somehow have to test whether our assumptions make sense in practice or not. And this is, of course, still is sort of a toy example, but at least we are, um, I think, going a bit more uh, towards reality and less towards simulations. So. Good. So this is the same story as you will see. Um, it's sort of a very similar results. So again, we consider now a distribution that is just a linear function of x. And now there's something nice happening. So if you have a nonlinear function, you don't need to worry about the distribution of the noise anymore. Can be Gaussian or not Gaussian, it doesn't matter. So the statement is the same. So then you're saying if f is nonlinear, then there's no backward model. So then you cannot write x as a function of g. And again, I will uh, sort of show you an example. So here you just look at one 
one concrete function, this is the x to the three that you have seen in the code, um, with some Gaussian noise. So how does the scatter plot look like? So this is even an injective function, so it doesn't matter whether it's injective or not, the argument still holds. So this is here an injective function. And then again, you cannot sort of model the, uh, find a good model in the opposite direction. Why? Same argument as before, even if you would try. So now I'm showing you, I will be showing you a, um, a plot in the opposite direction that looks like this. So this is the best fit in the opposite direction. And again, you have the same effect that sort of the residuals change, the distribution of the residuals change uh, for different input values, right? So here you have a very, um, a very large support, whereas here the support becomes smaller and smaller. So if you plot the residuals, here this is what you find. This is a very, um, very large support, whereas here you get smaller support. Okay, so it's the, the same idea, same idea basically. Any questions about this? Good. Um, I don't need to, uh, need to show you. I think uh, this is the same idea, right? So again, what we're doing is we have seen this before. In practice, now what you do is you just regress one variable on the other, check whether the residuals are independent, and then you can do this in, in both directions. This is what you would find. This is an example that I gave at the beginning, right? So this is altitude and temperature. Um, and this, I think, now leads to uh, some points that are worth discussing. So here, what you, would, what you would think is that the altitude is causing the temperature, right? And indeed, if you look at a fit, uh, this is now a real data set, if you look at the fit, this looks like a reasonable fit. And if you do this procedure, so what we can now do is we can look at the p-values that we get from the independence test. And indeed, the p-value the, like for the forward direction is much, much larger than the p-value for the backward direction. The question that is now um, sort of becoming important is uh, like when do we decide and when do we stop deciding? So here we already see that this p-value, I mean, is much, much larger than this one, but it's still 2%, right? So it's not, not a perfect fit. And this problem becomes uh, maybe even more apparent if you go to a different example. So this is the chocolate uh, example that I showed you at the beginning. So I once uh, downloaded the data in order to try this out. It turns out this is a super messy data set. So these are actually um, uh, the data points are like from very different sources from very different years even. So I'm not sure like whether this is a, a good data set to use. Um, and also you have very, very few data, uh, data points here. So it's about 25 or something. Um, you can do the same experiment. So we, in a way, we don't have uh, enough data for chocolate here. Um, but you can do the same experiment for coffee. Uh, so this is a data set that I found. It's the same uh, sort of statement. I didn't do a nice picture out of this, but the, the um, sort of plot looks the same. So here, what you're doing is you're looking at the coffee consumption per person per year and the number of Nobel Prize winners. And again, you see a very strong dependence. So the um, sort of the p-value for correlation is super tiny. So this seems to be significant. And then if you would now, if you look at sort of our inference procedure, now you want to say, see whether, what happens now. It's like uh, the coffee consumption causing the Nobel Prize winners or is it vice versa? So then you can apply our procedure and what do you think will happen? I mean, if you just apply it, yeah. I think we're going to see that the uh, coffee causes. Uh... <laughs> As someone, exactly. So what you will see is in, in practice, I mean, if you just apply the methods, you will find that you don't find a good fit in any directions. So the, the residuals are very strongly dependent. So here you get a p-value. I mean, of course, there's a question of how meaningful this is, but it's very small, right? So 10 to the minus 78 is if you just use the Dependence test is a black box or 10 to the minus 12. So you find very bad model fits in, uh, in any direction. So what does it mean now? And this is, I think, an important, you can say, I mean, I would even say it's a feature. Because this can mean several things. So it could mean that the model class is too small. So this means, I mean, we are writing down, we are assuming that y is really a function of x plus some independent noise. And this is a very strong model assumption, right? So of course, we are using this in practice a lot. We are often like, whenever you're using regression, you are looking at models of this form. But still, saying that the noise acts in an additive way is a very strong assumption. So it could be that this model class is too small. Or it could be, and this I think happens in this, uh, uh, in this particular case, 
uh, something that we call causally insufficiency. So this means that there are some variables that are super important for our problem, but that are not included in our causal model. And I would claim that this happens here because, uh, as we have argued like yesterday, there's probably something like the economic strength that, that is causing both of these, uh, these random variables. And in these cases, then, I mean, in a way, it's good that you don't find any, uh, any direction, right? So that you don't have a strong favor of one of these directions. This is something to think about because now what, what, uh, like sort of what comes to, to mind is, well, when is the p-value actually too small? This looks a bit like an innocent que question, but I think in practice it's important to think about because, I mean, we all know this, uh, this famous saying that all models are wrong and some are useful. And here now it, it really becomes important. So you, we have seen before, for example, that one, the correct direction had a p-value of 2%. So is this now a good fit or is this a bad fit? We know that if you include more and more data, at some point the p-value will, will go smaller and smaller because no matter how good your model is, it's probably wrong. So at some point you will reject. So if you are now basing an inference technique on these model classes, on these model fits, one has to be a bit careful uh, sort of when to decide. Yeah, there are many heuristics one could choose. Yeah? I just had, had a question. In, in terms of when you're testing going one direction versus going the other direction in terms of the, the function classes, does it matter in terms of uh, that you're res restricting them to the same type? Like here, linear Range? to linear, it, it, linear, to linear is, is, is easy, but non-linear, non like, in other words, the, 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 the reverse direction, whether that function takes on a, a very different form than... than um, so this is the question about reparameterization, or not reparameterization, but rescaling? Right, or, I mean, like, you know, whether one is linear, the other is, like, is polynomial or... Aha, or, um. uh -huh. so okay, so what I didn't say now is like how to do the model fit. In the linear case it's easy, but in the nonlinear case. So there um, you have to use a nonlinear regression technique and, um, and an independence test, right? So these are the two components that you choose. And what usually what we are trying, I'm trying very hard to do that always, is to say, okay, whenever you have a method that uh, has these two building blocks, it should work if you replace uh, these building blocks by something else, right? So I wouldn't say that there's one canonical choice of a nonlinear regression technique. So if you would find that uh, sort of the performance of your method depends a lot on the regression technique, this is a bad sign, right? So what we are using in practice, uh, I mean, in this, we have been using the Gaussian process regression a lot. Uh, in this particular case in R, I have uh, been using these uh, GAM uh, regression, like additive models. Uh, you, there are several choices, and I don't think that one performs much better than the other. The independence test, the same thing. We are just using this HSIG because it can be used very nicely as a black box method. Even if you have discrete data or categorical data, it doesn't matter, so you can just plug it in. That's why we find it convenient. Yeah. If you apply the different independence tests, you would have different p-values there, right? And I'm, uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm a bit dubious of an uh, independent test that yet, like, 10 to the minus 78. Yeah, it's, based it's on, certainly, this is Based really on 50 weird. observations, no, I mean, those yeah. things must be discrete somehow, you're not yeah, yeah. No, I agree. So it just makes a continuous approximation of what yeah. you get. And so is there, like, have you ever tried to look at, like, you know, some box plot of the p-values of the difference between the p-values they would get across, I don't know, 10 different independent tests or something? Uh, no, but this would be something interesting to try. Uh, we haven't. I mean, what you're usually doing is if you're really, I mean, I, uh, maybe I should update this because at some point I, I agree, I fully agree. So at some point I switched to like permutation tests or something. So they, like if, in order to, I mean, use the same test statistic, but just use a permutation because these p-values are ridiculous, right? But then um, here, I don't know how many data points th these are, but mm, yeah. So this is what uh, what I at some point did. But it's a good suggestion, yeah. I think one should do that. Yeah. So maybe a couple questions on this: uh, How you got this uh, gam model fitting? So in your case, you have y. Y is actually a nonlinear function of x. So uh, first question is: uh, So uh, what type of nonlinear based kind of model in gam? The second is: uh, Do you actually use cross validation? And uh, what is the total sample size that you have in actually getting the view? Okay, so I mean, there, there are several questions at once. Um, so again, so the nonlinear regression technique really doesn't matter. I don't want to promote gum now or anything. <coughs> I mean, whatever you like to use, use it should work. It, it's fine. This also, the, I mean, regards. So now, if you rescale your data, it's a bit of a question of your nonlinear regression technique, no, to recover this. Um, how many data points you need? So there, I would like to. 
uh, sort of point you to, I mean, they had, we also did a lot of simulation studies uh, and many other people did as well. So this is my, I mean, it depends now a lot on the number of nodes. So for two variables, I mean, they are, you, I mean, now it depends on, <laughs> this is clear now, it depends also on the kind of nonlinearity. We'll briefly talk about this. Because if you can imagine, if you're in a linear Gaussian setting, for example, you're not identifiable. So you need a bit of nonlinearity to, to become identifiable, right? So the question is, if you, you can imagine, if you have a very strong nonlinearity, then of course you need fewer sample sizes. And this is a question that I would like to uh, see answered in, in theory, but I, I will show one result that points at the direction, but that is not general enough. Uh, I think it's an open question to ask this, how does the sample size that you need in order to get a reliable estimate for the direction depend on the nonlinearity. So, but in simulations, that ha this has been asked, and I, I can, I'm happy to point you at this. There's maybe one thing that I, would, I should say. So this, these nonlinear models, they look like this, right? And this is a, a thing that um, relates now the, to this rescaling. So these are the models that we are looking at. And what you can do, I'm not sure whether I put a reference in here, but this is work by Konzang, for example. Uh, what you can do is you, you still get the same result if you apply a sort of nonlinearity afterwards. So this is a bijective function. So then you have a much broader model class that also allows for rescaling, like nonlinear rescalings, and you still have this identifiability. But then, for example, if you go to this model class, this is why I'm mentioning it, this is much, much harder to fit. If you ha have the identity, G is like gone, then this is a very standard regression problem. If you have a bijective transformation afterwards, this is much harder to fit. But still, you have this identifiability. But there, you probably need, like again, many more samples, many more data points in order to be able to fit this. Yeah? And to be Gaussian. Uh, for the results? <laughs> OK, I'm a bit. So otherwise, I think you can invert all the, if G is an F or one to one. Can't you just invert it and get into this? Uh, no, because there's, this is still a lot of structure. So if this, is, if this is smooth and this is invertible, then you still have identifiability, even if this is non Gaussian. And yeah, you assume independence here. So and why? independent of x. This is, I mean, another way to look at it is this is also a bit, I mean, it looks a bit innocent, but this is a strong assumption, this additivity here. OK, I mean, I'm, I would like to sort of uh, show you a bit what you can do with this. So this is now a result on this real data sets that we have. And I'm not say, saying that we solved cross inference, but this is an indication that there seems to be some signal in the data. So what do you see here? Um, on the y-axis, you see the um, accuracy. So you're asking your method. So you're presenting a data set, and you know x is the cause and y is the effect. Then you're asking your method, what do you think? And how, like, how certain are you? And then what you always do is you always check how many of the guesses of your methods are correct. So you want to be, of course, at 100%. So now what you see is from the x-axis, you see that you, you allow the method to sort of um, start over here with the cases where it's most confident. And there you can think of, I mean, if, if it really looks like independence in one direction and uh, independence in the other, like independence in one and dependence in the other, then you would be very confident. So you're saying, well, I'm pretty certain that x is the cause. Whereas if you find that in both directions, you will have a very small p-value, so you find dependence, then you're saying, well, I'm not so sure about this. Um, and the other case that can happen, of course, if you find independence in both directions, then you're probably in the linear Gaussian case. So both models, both directions allow for a good fit. So what you see here is that um, here are the cases where the methods are very certain about. And this additive noise, for example, this is this red stuff. What you see is that it is, seems to be outperforming at least random guessing. So there's a very complicated plot. So here this 50%. And this is a, a debatable um, um, a shaded area for um, something that indicates whether you are significantly above 50% or not. But this is point wise. And what you see is that the red line is not perfect, but at least it seems to be outperforming random guessing. And here, this green one is the linear stuff. And what you also see, I mean, you shouldn't overinterpret these, these uh, curves, I think. But what you see is that many of the cases are the linear fit is just too bad, right? So it's too performing slightly worse there. These other methods are um, so sort of competing methods. I'm sorry, what's the decision rate? What? 
So the decision rate is how, so this means you have to decide in all the cases. Let's say we have 90 uh, data points, uh, da like data sets. So we have nine, these 90 pictures that I showed you. And this decision rate of 100% means you have to always decide X is the cause or Y is the cause. And here, if you go down, this allows the method to only decide in 40% of the cases. This means that the method is allowed to say, I do not know. Which I think makes sense, because if it's really a bad model fit in both directions, you may not want to say anything. But then what's the meaning of the method? It sees that it doesn't decide just to get a range of... So there, the message says, I do not know, try something else. I mean, there's, there's this is maybe a general comment here. So the question is, what can we believe, what can we expect from uh, causal discovery, recovery, right? So I think, or that's my hope, is that it should be a guide. We should use it uh, as a guide. So, I mean, it's a very complicated problem, but the hope is that it gives a guidance to say, well, these are the, the good candidates for like uh, causal relations. And maybe the biologist, so if you think about, you have uh, like 6,000 genes that you could uh, try to intervene on to see an effect on the phenotype, then what do you do? I mean, uh, like if you use a statistical method, then you're using a variable selection technique, for example. Whereas the hope is that causal methods can say, well, we have these 100 genes that are well, good statistical candidates, but I believe these 20 ones are good causal candidates. So try these 20, first, uh, 20 variables first. And therefore, I think it's actually a very good feature to say in some cases, I do not know. Because you have methods like, I'm not sure whether you know Granger causality. These are methods for causal discovery as well in time series settings. They always give an answer. And I'm not so sure whether this is a good, good thing or not. Because even if the assumptions are like strongly violated, it's a very quick and easy method and you always get an answer. But what does it mean? So in this sense, I think, especially in causal inference, is actually a feature to say, well, I'm not so sure about this case. It's, it seems to have, my assumptions seem to be not met. You be able to build a test that's so that, that's because your test is built on does x cause y or, or I mean does x not cause y or does x cause y and then the the other test the other way around. Could you build a test that's like does x cause y and the alternative be uh, or y cause? I think so. Yeah, we have looked into this and not with the independence test though. We see uh, like a method for that is more based on likelihoods. Um, where I think you can do that, yeah. Principle Reichenberg that you tried to sell to us yesterday, which was if they're correlated, one must be causing the other, or they have a common cause or something like this. Yeah, but that's fine. No? But it, of course, then it becomes easier because here we are making model assumptions. The Reichenbach principle is uh, without sort of it's only assuming a structural causal model. Whereas here, we, okay, it's very imp it's now a question about how you phrase your test, right? What's the null hypothesis? But here, I think it's only possible if you sort of restrict yourself to these model classes. Good. Yeah. Ten valid examples where you actually agree yeah. on which one's causing the other. Uh, where did most of the methods fail? Do you have an example of what, what the plot looks like fail? Um, <coughs> in fact, uh, some of these, for example, uh, these ones here. And what you see is that this probably, this is, I mean, this is a, sometimes you have like a heteroscedastic noise, no? And this is just not included in our model class. But I think even there, it's a bit tricky. I also saw, saw, uh, thought so all the time because of the exponential, but if you write it down, it's not so clear. So what you want to have is you want to allow a, like a factor here that depends on x in a smooth way, right? I think it's also identifiable, but I don't think anyone has properly looked at this. But my intuition would be it is still possible, and then maybe you would get these cases as well, for example. Yeah. I mean, some of these are very, I don't know what this kind of models one would expect here. Yeah. Good, uh, we do a break here. So what's coming, um, what's coming in the next hour? So this is, of course, the two variable case. And I would like to argue that this is sort of the most challenging case. So we have done all the hard work now. The rest follows like uh, trivially, trivially. So in a way, if you solve the two variable case, the d variable case is, uh, is sort of you get for free. And then we will briefly look at these restricted structural causal models for like more than two variables. Um, and then we will see uh, one more idea for causal inference. Good. So a small break. The thing that we discussed, but uh, what is nice as I 
uh, promised is that in certain senses, these two variable cases are really the hard ones. Um, and so it turns out that whenever you have identifiability for two variables, this um, uh, sort of implies in a very nice way identifiability for any number of variables. And why is this? So I, of course, don't write the proof, but just to get an idea. Um, so think about proving the following statement. So now let's consider this uh, additive class of additive noise models. And we are just looking at uh, sort of two different models that have a different structure with three random variables. And now the question is, how can we reduce this to the two variable case? Um, so what do we need to prove? So prove that the distribution over x, y, and z does not satisfy the following two models at the same time. First this one. So x is just noise, y is a function of x and z, plus some noise, and z is a function of x and noise. This is the first model. And the second one, so what is the corresponding graph? So here we have x causing y and z, and z causing y. And the second one will just be the same, but with this arrow inverted. So again, x is just noise. y is now a function of x. And z is a function of x and y. So what is the argument that we need here? So this is the statement. So we are saying, well, we know already the identifiability in the bivariate case. Let's say that's, the, that's uh, sort of already solved. And now we want to solve higher dimensional cases. So why is this the case? Well, how can we prove this? So we want to show that uh, the joint distribution does not allow for sort of these two models at the same time. So how can we reduce this? Uh, so we want, now want to imply a contra we want to sort of do proof by contradiction. So somehow this has to imply a statement that we know is false. So we want to sort of show that this cannot be the case. And what, you, what would you do? You have an idea? So here, of course, these, we all assume that these are nonlinear, right? At the same time, if the point f, g, h, j are nonlinear. Sorry? Did you say anything? No. Good. Do you want to answer the question? It's oh. fine. Ah, OK. So any ideas? You want to reduce it somehow to a two-variable problem. Yes. And how can we do that? <laughs> yeah, we just condition on x. So we just condition on x, because then what you have is, so you have that y condition on x. This is just now a linear function. Nonlinear function, so this is the case if you just condition on x. This is f of small x, comma z, plus some noise. And of course, if you do it like in sort of this, on this side, it's the same thing. Right? So you just condition these equations on x. And this is sort of the main idea, and it turns out that this is really the, the key step here. So this you can always do. So you can always, no matter, you, you start with two different graphs, and you can always, by a sort of clever procedure, you can always find. Uh, sort of uh, some variables such that if you condition on these, you are reduced to a bivariate case. And of course, this is not important for methods or something, but this tells you, uh, hopefully this give an, gives an intuition why sort of this is a very strong and powerful, uh, powerful result here. Good, so again, then sort of these, these results we get for free. So uh, just look at the same thing. So again, we're looking at structural causal models, and we are asking, well, can we somehow recover the structure from the joint distribution? And as we have seen in the bivariate case, the answer is, in general, we cannot. So if we, if we don't assume anything about the form of the functions, the answer here is no, right? So this was the idea of like constructing, if we want to prove this, using uniform noise and then looking at adverse CDFs. That's the, that's the result. You can read it in, in the book if you like. It's not 
not surprising. But this is the positive result. Indeed, you can do something if you um, assume some more structure, for example, that you have additive noise. It's a strong assumption, but by the argument that I gave over there, so then we get the identifiability. So here the answer is yes. If you're in the Gaussian setting, you just need to assume that the, the um, functions are nonlinear. Okay, so there's, uh, this is sort of an overview picture, if you like. So it, I think this is, <laughs> this is a bit interesting to see. So <coughs> um, but it turns out that if you look at a general structure causal model, then you don't have identifiability, right? So uh, he, this is, in a, in a way, this is model class is too large. So then if you restrict yourself in saying, well, okay, you have these uh, additive noise settings, then uh, and if you have nonlinear functions, then indeed you get identifiability. So then it is possible to recover the graph structure from the joint distribution. You can even be more specific. So if you say that these functions are sort of additive in its, um, in its components. This is also a very nice model class to study. Uh, these are sometimes called causal additive models. And then, then again, you have identifiability. But then if you're going to linear Gaussian models, you lose this. So somehow, this, although we often think that this is a nice uh, uh, model to play with, right? And this is what people have done for many, uh, many years. This is, in a way, a very hard case. And this is a hard case. So the most general and the sort of the most simple, these uh, cases are very hard. And there's a lot of space in between that uh, people have not studied yet. So the question is really, can we somehow sort of describe these function classes where we get identifiability? And I don't think we have a satisfying answer there. Yeah? that the functions are non-linear. Uh, is it enough if just like in each uh, connected component of the graph, one function is non-linear? Ah, this is a good, a good question that has been recently studied. Um, uh, also from some people in Zurich, uh, from Jan Ernest. So the qu question of mixed linear and nonlinear uh, functions, and this has been answered. You can uh, characterize whenever where you need nonlinearities. Indeed, your intuition is correct. Uh, you can deal with some linear uh, linearities in the graph. Yeah. Line can be Gaussian or not? Yeah, so I'm writing this down. I'm, one always has to be a bit careful. So I'm always writing this down for Gaussian noise. But in principle, you can think of here allowing for non-Gaussian noise. Why I'm not writing this? Because there's, there's one uh, counter example as well, except for the linear Gaussian case. It's a very um, sort of non-generic example where you tweak the distribution of the noise and you adjust it with the function uh, very carefully. And then there's one more very weird <laughs> counter example uh, where you don't have identifiability. But uh, this is why I always write things down for Gaussian noise. But you can show that in this, you can make rigorous. So um, this is identifiable in uh, almost all of the cases. So there's some rigorous theory, but I didn't write down the theorems here. So this is the picture. So we have the empire of additive noise. Uh, and there's like this one uh, little village uh, that is not identifiable. And this is the linear Gaussian case. So this is the bad guy in the story. <laughs> so this is uh, what you can uh, remember. It's a bit funny, because this is uh, usually a model that we like a lot. OK, so this is uh, something that I would, I mean, for the statisticians among you, uh, this is something that I would like to uh, pose as a problem that I think is interesting. So there's another way of looking at this. So if you now look at sort of the, um, I drew the, these manifolds, but of course, this has to be a bit made more rigorous here. But so if you now look at the space of all distributions that you can obtain by an additive noise model from x to y, let's call this this red space. And if you at the same time look at the models that you can obtain with an additive noise model from y to x, then these models intersect. Right? So we, here we know that if you're in the linear Gaussian case, we can be either x causing y or y causing x. But m all the other parts, they do not intersect. So now the question is, of course, well, if our true distribution lies here, we can also use a different inference technique, right? So if our now we receive a data set from this distribution, this is the empirical distribution that might lie around here. So then, of course, if you know if you're only given our empirical distribution and you want to find out, well, are we in this red or in this green model class? What do you do? You just check which one is closer, right? And this is known as the principle of maximum likelihood. It's the same thing. So if you now just want to check which one is closer in KL, um, then maximum likelihood is in this sense. Um, equivalent to minimizing the KL distance. And this is what you can do. Here, the method is just choose the direction that corresponds to the, to the closest subspace. 
You can do this, and I'm not going into much details here, but this is sort of the idea. So you now go in the, like, more, if you have more than two variables, what you would do in practice is you just go over all the possible graphs, and you always sort of compute a maximum likelihood estimator. Or, written differently, you sort of uh, um, minimize the KL distance. And what is this? In the Gaussian setting, it's very easy to compute. And I'm trying to give a bit of an intuition here. Why do we get this? So in the Gaussian setting, this is very easy to compute. And what you find is the following. You have a candidate graph structure. And now you want to say, how, how well does my graph fit the data? So what you do is, you always have your candidate DAG, your candidate structure, has some parents from the variable xi. Right? And what you're doing is, you're regressing xi on its parents, and then you look at the residuals. And somehow the intuition should be, well, if these residuals are very large on average, then it's sort of a bad, bad structure, right? Then it's not a very good fit. So what you do is you look at the variance of the residuals from, these, uh, from each of the nodes. Okay? So if you have a candidate graph structure, you want to say, how well am I fitting? This corresponds to saying, how close am I to this subspace? What do you do? For each variable, you check which are my parents, and I perform a regression. Then I look at the residuals. I compute the variance of the residuals, and I want to say, well, if this is very large, then this is bad, right? So this is why what you're doing is you're looking for the graph structure that has this minimal uh, score of this, this type. So this should be, look familiar if you are used to, like, to maximum like, likelihood here. It's, there's no magic. Yeah? So if I'm only in the two variable case, then this is only measuring the size of the residuals, and it's not telling me anything about independence. Can I just find cases where there's complete dependence between like my residuals are almost deterministic functions of x, and uh, and uh, and and have the smaller smaller residuals in one case than the other? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think you can. But it, indeed, I mean, if you look at this, so I can I can show you the the code. I mean, you're right in the two variable case. This is super easy. So I have this. I happen to have this here as well, right? So. I remind you what was the example here. We have two variables. So this is the, the scatter plot. We have already seen what you can do is just regress y on x and x on y and check the independence of residuals. This other method, this likelihood is alternative. It, it's an alternative. It works exactly uh, like you can see here. So what are you doing? We are sort of for each of the candidate structures, what we are doing is we are computing the residuals, computing the variance of this guy, the log, and then we sum over all variables. In this case, it's only two variables. Right? So if you do this, you will find that in this first direction, what do you get? 0.14. And in the other direction, you get minus 1 point something. So indeed, here also, it's not surprising. It's a simulated data set. But here, you get a much better score for the graph x causing y compared to y causing x. So here, this is, this is super easy, because we only have two candidate graph structures. Is this clear? So this is a very simple method, if you like, that you can do. And here it's just, OK, you run over the different graphs. You, for each graph, you compute this guy. And then you check which graph leads to the best, uh, yields the best score. But now there are a couple of problems with this. What are the problems? OK, several problems. We start with your problem. There's a lot of graphs. There's a lot of graphs. How many graphs are there? So for two variables, how many DAGs are there? Yeah, y is 3 because we have x causing y, y causing x, and the empty graph. What about three nodes? So we have sort of three nodes that we can connect, right? And we always can plug in either the empty, the no connection, in one direction or the other. So what you get is 3 to the 3, which is 27, I think, right? But then we are, we are not allowed to have cycles. So there are two possible cycles, so we subtract two, so we get 25. Um, for four nodes, <laughs> not so clear. Uh, so I, uh, I show you this graph. This is how it looks like. So for two nodes, you have uh, three decks, then 25. The next answer would have been 543. Um, and then it increases quite quickly. What I like about this plot is, and you show that this shows that it's a super exponential growth, no? Because the length of the numbers <laughs> is like more than linear. So it's a very nice uh, a sequence. And this website, 
maybe you already know it, otherwise I can recommend this. I don't know who's producing this, but this includes like many, many integer sequences where you find everything that you can ever think of. Yes, this is indeed a problem. So you cannot, there are like too many decks. Uh, this is one problem. There's another problem as well. I already show you here. So the other problem is that sort of you know, you have to be a bit careful because here you don't penalize the number of edges. And this is, of course, bad because you can always reduce the likelihood. You can always get a better fit if you in, uh, include more edges. So this is something that in practice you have to worry a bit about as well. And what do you do? So one possibility is to just penalize something, right? So like PIC, this is what people do in practice. Or there's another thing that I would like to uh, sort of mention here. The difficult bit in causal discovery, and this is important to remember, I think, the difficult bit is always to find the correct causal ordering. Removing edges afterwards is super easy. So imagine you have like a deck that looks like this. And now what you're doing is you find the correct causal ordering, but your method has some extra edges. So let's say, to be careful to not create cycles, we have this guy and this guy. So these are wrong edges. But you found sort of the correct causal ordering, but you have too many edges. How do you get rid of them? Well, this is just normal statistics. So you just look at, for example, this model here, Z. You see that it's explained by X and Y. And then you just do a variable selection technique. So this is like standard statistics. You don't have to use a causal method for this. Finding the, the, the causal ordering, this is the hard bit. And this is, for example, where you need ideas. Uh, for example, like, I don't know, these additive noise models or other ideas. But uh, removing extra additional edges, this is just standard statistics. OK? Good. I think I skipped this. So how do you deal with the number of DAGs? So what you could do in, in practice is just do some greedy searches. There are a couple of ways. Probably you can think of them uh, yourself. There's something that is called the um, greedy uh, um, uh, from uh, Chickering et al. They looked at uh, some of these greedy searches. Um, but I think I asked it this. This is self-explaining. This is a statistical question that I would like to raise that I uh, asked earlier. Because you asked, like, how many data points do I need? And I'm, so I try to answer that as follows. Somehow it depends now on the nonlinearity that you have, right? Because you can imagine if you're very close to this intersection, so if you're very close to the linear Gaussian setting, then of course the identifiability is much harder because your true distribution may lie on this red manifold, but then because of the, you have empirical data, it's much harder to decide are you closer to the green one or the red one. So what I think needs to be studied to get these final sample results but you can do it uh, if you're doing it in a, in a different way. I would be very happy as well. But I think what you, one needs to study is the following question. So you are looking at a distribution on this, uh, this model class, x goes to y. And then you want to find out, well, how close am I to the wrong model class? And this must depend on the nonlinearity that you're looking at. It's sort of intuitively, it's clear. And this is uh, something that I, I tried to look at. But again, I didn't go. Uh, I, I didn't go very far here, but this is um, what we managed to do. So if you, for example, have a nonlinear function that you parameterize with beta, so if you have y is beta times x squared plus some noise, and again, you're looking at the Gaussian case, which is the easiest, then what you're trying to ask is, well, how far are we from the, from the wrong model class? So what is the closest model in the wrong model class. And we know certainly that this is larger than zero. This is, we know from our identifiability result, right? So, but the identifiability result doesn't specify how far we are. It's just, OK, if you, you either have this model or this model, but not both at the same time. But what we need to find out is how far are we actually. And in this very simple setting, you can compute it. And that's the ans answer that you get. The logarithm of this, this term that scales with uh, beta squared. Not so surprising that you get a beta squared here because the KL is sort of a squared distance, I guess, right? So but this is what you find. And also, it depends on the signal to noise ratio, which, ma which makes sense as well. Because if you're adding a lot of noise, then basically you have independent, uh, then y and x become independent. And then, of course, you're not uh, and identifiable either, right? 
not important for the remainder of the talk, but this is an open question. So whether we can study this in a, uh, in a more general setting and even maybe with more than two variables. But I think this is needed to understand how many data points we need. Good. This is the next visual break. So this is um, uh, Smørbrød, which is uh, in Denmark. It's very uh, popular, and this is just bread with butter. Uh, but they put a lot of stuff on it, and then you get even the it's pretty fancy, I like it a lot. So you even get uh, schnapps that corresponds to the uh, uh, specific bread that you have. So I can recommend whenever you're in Copenhagen, have some smurrebrol. Are there any questions about this part so far? So this was the second idea that we talked about. This is restricting the structural causal models. So we gain identifiability by really looking at uh, sort of models where we are saying, well, we don't allow a full general model here. But we are saying, for example, what happens, we are asking what happens if you have additive noise. Any questions about this? Um, good. So then uh, before we go to the sort of last idea, I would like to uh, say one word about simulations. So this is something that I think uh, um, it's interesting to think about when you want to find out, well, how well are my causal inference techniques actually working? So how, what would you do is you would generate data from a known structure. Then you apply your inference technique, and you ask, well, how well did I recover my structure? So now here's a question. So this is a, a very famous drawing from Leonardo da Vinci, who invented all sorts of stuff. And this is a, some a, a sort of protection for a horse. And the question is now, you imagine you have a copy of this, guy, of this uh, drawing. So you're given an original drawing, the left one, that's correct, and you have a copy. And you want to find out how good is the copy. And I want to claim here that this is a, not a well-defined question, because it really depends on what you want to do with the copy. And this, this matters a lot. So if you want to use this drawing, and uh, you want to do a copy, and then you want to sell your copy, claiming that it's the original, then want to become rich, then the answer to this question, how good your copy is, is very different um, than compared to the situation where one guy just wants to say, ah, this is a brilliant idea. I have a horse at home. I want to build this, uh, whatever this is, the mold of the horse's head myself. So I make a copy of this. And then the question of how good your copy is is very different, because there you maybe only want to find the correct instructions and maybe want to look at the number of lines that is important for building this, this mold. So what I'm trying to say is, if you want to sort of say how good your copy is, it really matters what you want to do with the copy. And the same, the same holds for causal graphs. So if you are given a true causal graph, and then you, you have an estimate, and you want to say, how good is my estimate? It really depends what you want to do with the graph. And this is something that I find a bit surprising sometimes whenever like, this holds for all graphical models. When also when you look at undirected graphs, for example, and then you have an estimate, and you want to say, well, how good is the estimate? I would say we have to think much more about like, what do you want to do with it? So that's the question that I, I put here. What is currently done in practice a lot is uh, to look at something that is called a structural hemming distance. And this is the first thing that comes to mind, of course. So you have an, a graph. Let's say this one is the correct one, not the green one. And then you have a method that estimates this graph. And the estimate maybe looks like this. So you are missing some edges. This one is correct. This one is correct. And maybe we have an additional one. So what does the structural hemming distance do? It just counts the number of edges that are wrong. So you get a mistake of 1 for this guy. You get a mistake of 1 for this guy. And a mistake of 1 for this guy. Because you did three mistakes, so the structural hemming distance between these uh, two graphs is 3. <coughs> That's fine. You can do this. But I would claim this is only, a, in what sense is this a meaningful distance? It's only meaningful if you want to say, well, how close do they, I mean, how similar do they look or anything? Um, the alternative is to say, well, what are we using this graph for? We are using this graph for doing causal inference. So therefore, um, we suggested to use a distance that is much closer to this. It's a bit technical. That's why I don't go into details. But just the, what's the principal idea? So the principal idea would be to say, well, if you, now you're using your graphical estimate, for, for example, for computing causal effects, then the distance you come up with is very different. 
Because imagine you have um, two components in the graph. So you have a lot of stuff here, x, y, z, w, and they're all very nicely connected. And then you have sort of uh, one edge that points at another cluster where you have a lot of connections here. And then maybe if you get this edge wrong, this is actually a very bad mistake because then you get many causal effects that are incorrect. Whether maybe this edge, if you get this edge incorrect, it doesn't matter so much. And how could you do this, formally define this? This is, in principle, you can all do this so now, hopefully, because we have looked at this adjustment, right? So you, we always say that whenever you want to compute a causal effect from x to y, we adjust by the, by the parents of x. So what you can define is to say, how many of these causal effects do I actually get wrong? So there, I know there's a true graph. I know I can compute causal effects. And how many of these sort of causal effects do I get incorrect when I, um, when I use my estimate? is something that we call, I skipped the definition here, that is something that we call this structural intervention distance. And these plots only show that this is quite different from the structural hemming distance that you see here. So what you see is that for many different graphs, we simulate graphs and you always check what is the structural intervention distance and what's the structural hemming distance. And if they are equivalent, they should lie on a line, but they are quite different. And this is just maybe something to think about. So I really do think when, whenever we are estimating something like this, we have to sort of, if you want to evaluate how well your method performs, we should take this into account. Why does this become important? Because I think um, if you now want to draw causal conclusions, um, how well methods actually perform, uh, I think the structural intervention distance is more meaningful to look at. So this is one simulation result. There are many, many, many others, but I just uh, want to point out one here. So what you see is you see different causal methods. So this is the additive noise model that you have seen. This is Lingam that you have seen as well. This is the linear. This is the nonlinear additive noise. This is the linear noise. This is a PC. This is this uh, independence-based method that we have seen before. This is a version of it called conservative PC. This is greedy equivalent search. This is uh, very similar in the linear Gaussian setting. It also looks at um, trying to find the mark of equivalence class. And this is just randomly guessing the DAG. And what you find is for many simulation studies, so you have 100 nodes. Um, you, you report this structural hemming distance, and this is just a box plot. So what you see here is, aha, all these methods perform very nicely, very much better than random guessing, for example. Um, so here, if you zoom in as well, I mean, here you see slight differences. So this is indeed, a, it's a simulation that favors a bit the additive noise model, but it also shows you that if you have these nonlinearities in your data, um, they really help. So this is something that is much more robust compared to the PC, for example. What I want to say is now, if you look at this other distance, the picture changes a bit because this is the structural intervention distance. And then suddenly you see that you're not doing much better than random guessing anymore. And this is something that I think is important. So we have to somewhat be honest about which scenarios can we actually hope the, the causal inference techniques to work and which ones are still too, too difficult. And this is a very high dimensional setting. So I think you have like 100 nodes and I don't remember, I think 100 data points or something. This is something you can think about applying your methods, but I would be curious. I would say this is in a range. If you are in this nonlinear settings, this is much, much easier. So then you can really beat, sort of, you can get some signal out of it. But otherwise, I would be curious. I would be sort of a bit careful. So whenever you're reading re these results, I think it's, it's nice to include the random guessing. And also, I think uh, this structural intervention, this is something to look at. Good. Any questions about this? Just a general comment, maybe. Good. Then there's, uh, there's only one thing left uh, for sort of this, uh, this part of the, the course, this um, causal discovery. And this is something, uh, this is a third idea. So the first idea was the independence-based approach. We, have, uh, we connected the distribution and the graph. The second one was to look at these, um, these functions structural equations here and restrict the function classes. And now we will, uh, I will briefly talk about one more idea that I will also talk about in more detail uh, tomorrow. But I would like to mention the idea um, because I think it's a very interesting one. 
What's the setup? The setup changes now slightly. So we are saying we are concentrated on one target variable. So we are um, not interested in finding the causal graph, the correct causal graph, but we are looking at something slightly easier. We, namely, we want to find the causal parents. So if you are given a causal graph like this, like this one, then as I mentioned earlier, you can use a lot of variables for prediction. But here in this setting, we are asking, okay, is there a way to find out the causal predictors? So in this sense, this would be just y. So here, really, the causal parents of y. Why is this interesting? Because whenever you want to change something, so in biology, whenever you want to sort of have an influence, you want to see which of these genes are actually causal for my phenotype, then you are asking exactly this question. So what are the causes for my phenotype? And this is the, uh, the setting we are looking at um, right now. The main idea will be um, the following. So this technique is now based on, so it's really a third idea. Uh, this idea is now based on an invariance principle that hopefully uh, you're now all sort of very familiar with. We will see in a second what it is. Um, but the idea will be to say that we have an underlying causal system that we don't know. So this is unknown. And we receive data from sort of different settings. So this is uh, what you can call an environment. So this is just some data in environment one, and this is data in environment two. And here we don't have to specify what these environments are. So they can be quite general. So you can think of, um, it's actually a bit more general, but for the purpose of this talk, I will uh, always phrase it that these different environments come from different interventional settings. So you just put a hammer somewhere uh, on the system and you just perturb the system, but you're not allowed to put a hammer on Y. So what happens now? So maybe you already see it. If this is the assumption, then there's one conditional that remained invariant. And we have seen this before, because this was this mute, the most useful tautology ever. And this means whenever you are intervening on x, only on x2, you're only intervening on x2. Which means whenever you're not intervening on y, you're not intervening on y. This means this structural equation for y remains the same over all environments. So this is the basic assumption um, that we are making here. And that's more or less the only assumption we have to make. OK, and this is the conditional that will remain invariant. So y given its parents, y given x3, this will be an invariant uh, conditional. And this is what we are trying to exploit. OK, so this is unknown, of course. We don't know the structure. We don't know where the hammers are. We don't know anything about the environments. We just observe data in two environments. If you want to find out the causal parents of y, what you could do is to say, well, I just look for which variables are good predictors. And if I, as I try to argue, this doesn't work. So this is the code. If you run it in, in R, so what you would do is you just regress Y on all predictors. And then you check what comes out of it. And of course, in the example I showed you before, all of these predictors are highly predictive. They are highly significant. That's not surprising, because if this is the ground truth, of course, unknown, but then, of course, all of these predictors are like, very good in predicting y, because they all carry a lot of information about y. So this is why the linear model just doesn't do the trick. So this is, uh, you have to do something else. And this is what we suggest. So I just show you the output and then uh, try to explain how it works. So this is what we call invariant causal prediction. Um, it looks very similar to, an invariant, uh, to a linear model. But there's one difference, namely, what you also like, give to the method is the index of the environment. So you're saying the first 250 data points are from environment one, no, no idea what this means. And then the next 150 data points are from environment two. OK, so this is all what you provide to the method. And then indeed, uh, it looks like magic, but it's not. <laughs> so it finds out that only variable number three is uh, really a cause. OK, so this method somehow can dis distinguish between variables that are just predictive and variables that are causes. And how does it do it? So the idea is super simple. It's, it's really only based on this, this invariance principle, on this mute principle. So that's the key idea, most useful tautology ever. The probability of y given its parents, this remains invariant if the structural equation for y does not change. Right? So I will show you a couple of examples, but hopefully this is now, now obvious. Look at this structural equation. It doesn't change. So this is always the same here. And this, of course, determines the conditional of y given x1, right? If you want to know what the conditional is, you just look at this equation, and then you can compute it. I mean, hopefully this is clear. So if y, if y is 2 times x plus some Gaussian 0, 1, then of course y given x 
It's just a Gaussian with mean 2 times x uh, and a variance 1, right? So this is the only thing that you need to determine the conditional here. So now if we intervene somewhere in the system, for example, of x1, this, system, this uh, edge here vanishes, but the conditional is always the same. It doesn't matter where I intervene. I can intervene on this guy. This can be a complicated intervention, so it can be like not removing errors, but just changing them. You can intervene at all the other places. It doesn't matter. So as long as you do not intervene on y, this condition is always the same. Okay. So again, this is the problem. We are given data from different environments. So let's call them curly E. So we had two environments in the example before. And then this is sort of the proposition. I'm now just stating what I just said in mathematical formula. So what it means is that so if you look at the parents, then the conditional of y given its parents, this is invariant. This is always the same. OK, so if you want to write it down as in a hypothesis, you're saying, well, these are our two environments. So we are saying for this set S star, this is the unknown set of parents. This is the thing we are trying to infer. Then we know that always this y given xs, this is always the same. And as I put this, this is a bit of a funny thing to write, right? When I put this down here, we are not making any assumptions on the, um, on the uh, distribution of the x's. It can be arbitrary. It doesn't matter. In practice, what we are doing is uh, you can actually also test this. We are going to look at a linear model, um, but there's actually no, no reason why to restrict yourself to linear models here. But what would it read? How would it read in a linear model setting? So it says that y is a linear function of x, and it's always the same linear function. So you have a gamma star that's always the same. In all environments, you have the same uh, sort of linear function. And the noise distribution here, this is also always the same. So here, you're basically saying, well, we have the same structural equation in all of these, uh, in all of these environments. That's, that's trivial, right? So how do we exploit this for a causal inference technique? So the goal is to find S star, right? And now what we are doing is we are running through all possible candidate sets S. That's the main idea. And always check, do we have invariance for the set S or not? So you go through all possible subsets, and you always check, is it invariant or not? And you know that for the true set, it will be invariant. For the others, you don't know. So this is here an example. So um, you go through all possible sets of covariates, and you always check, do I have this invariant satisfied or not? Do I have that in all these environments, this set leads to an invariant model or not? And maybe here you find yes, here you find no, here you find yes, aha. This was the correct model. Of course, we don't know that this is the correct model, that this is a star. But by assumption, you always find a yes answer for the correct model. But you don't know, is it this one or this one? Then you go further, you say no, and here again you have yes. And now what does the method do? This is the only formula you need. You just look at all the sets, all the good sets that are accepted, and you take the intersection. That's all what you do. Here, you're running through all possible sets. You always check, is the null hypothesis satisfied or not? And then you're taking the intersection. In this case, what is it? Just three, right? So three is the only variable that appears in all these, these sets. And then there's a, this is almost trivial, but what you get is that whenever this intersection is non-empty, so whenever you find a variable that is in this intersection, then with large probability, it must be in this set as well. So whenever the method outputs something, you know that it's correct. So you know with large probability that uh, it is contained in S star. And that's the whole trick. So you can write this down as a theorem. So it looks complicated, but it's just an, uh, this is just the output of the method, right? So S hat of E, this is what we call the output of the method. So with large probability, so this is the level of your test, let's say 1%. So with large probability, the output is contained in the true set. That's what you get. And I think this is a nice sort of a nice coverage guarantee because in practice, I think you want to have something like the method to say, I'm certain about this or not. And here, in many cases, we will see a couple of examples in a second. In many cases, the output will be empty, but in others, it will not. And whenever it's not empty, then you can be certain that it's correct. So this does not need any diversity in your experiments. You could have no. potentially one experiment, and then it would probably get something. You get empty, yeah, right. exactly. So if there's sort of a there's a guarantee built in here. So whenever your environments, 
yeah, environment one and environment two. So the idea is to make use of the diversity of the environments. And it, as Philip says, the, whenever they are the same, then, for example, I mean, the, we cannot, there's no diversity that we can make use of. So what will happen is that everything looks actually invariant, and the output will be the empty set. So then you just say, I, I have no idea. If you want to make this large, you can actually, um, so I didn't put the results here, but you can analyze this in an infinite sample version. So if you want to make this large, this at least intuitively means that you want to have very diverse environments. Because then less and less things become invariant and you're closer to the true set as star. So this is very hand baby, but this is uh, some of how you can read it. So the identifiability improves, and identifiability here means how many variables do I output if you have more and stronger interventions at better places or more heterogeneity in the data. Which is a bit of a funny thing to do because usually you want the data to be clean, but here we are saying uh, we want your data to be very dirty and uh, uh, changing over environments. Good, so this is an example. So you can think of the environment as well as being a sort of a variable um, that is influencing parts of the system. For example, here, the intervention, this first environment is just observational data, and then the second environment, you intervene on this guy, for example. And here it turns out that this is a very informative, uh, informative case. So this is, I mean, I chose this on purpose. So this is a very informative, um, uh, very informative intervention in the following sense. So if you are now running Sort of this method, how did, what does it do like behind the scenes? It always checks which of the variables uh, are sort of leading to a, an invariant model. And it sees here it's, for example, 2 and 4, uh, or 1, 2, 4, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. These are all invariant models. So then you sort of output the intersection. And indeed, in this case, it's 2 and 4, which indeed are the correct causal parents here. So only 2 and 4 get a p-value that is smaller than 5%. So this is what happens behind the scenes there. What I think is uh, important to look at is the, uh, the robustness, right? So what does the method do if my model assumptions are violated? For example, if I have nonlinear functions, whereas I thought I have linear ones. So here you see that y is now a nonlinear function of x2. Uh, and I, I assume that this is linear, but now it's nonlinear. So what, does, uh, what do we find? If you just run the method, you will find that there's no, um, no set that, um, that satisfies this invariance. And why is this the case? Because you somehow, at least intuitively, you want to be able to screen off the environment. You want to find a model that's always the same in all environments. And because you're only sort of screening off with linear functions, this will never be, be possible. So there's actually an argument, a formal argument that you can, you, you can make. So the idea is really, so if you have a model violation, that, like nonlinear models, usually this leads to a loss of power, but not to the coverage. So then you again output the empty set. There's one other way of, of model violations, so where you don't look at nonlinearities, but at, let's say, hidden variables. So what happens then? Um, so what is this? Ah, this is a, okay, I first do this. So this is a model violation with a hidden variable. So what happens then? So you can actually show that, so if you're now applying our method, so here we are missing one, one causal parent but we assume that we have all of them. So what happens then? Maybe you see this. So the, the x2 is not, so this is the true set in a sense, but this does not lead, lead to, to an invariant model because you open this weird path. So this path is then open so you, to the environment E. So here in this case, what you will find is that you get a couple of accepted sets. So one and one, two, one, three, and one, two, three, but the intersection is in fact one. It's not two. And you can show, that, so it's, in a way, it's wrong now, right? Because we were looking for the direct causes. But what you can show is that ever, whenever you have hidden variables like this, you get a set that is possibly wrong, but it's not super bad. Because what you can show is that it's always still a set of ancestors of y. Um, and in this sense, maybe it's not the cause of parents anymore, but it's at least ancestors. OK, last violation, if you have a intervention on y, that's also something we excluded. Uh, the same idea, you can show that no set is accepted, and again, uh, you are staying conservative. So then in this model violation, again, um, you don't accept anything, so you don't make a mistake. Good. Um, the last thing for today, um, or for this session, uh, just how does it work on real data? So this is some data set that we looked at. 
Um, this is gene perturbation from yeast from 2014. Uh, so something that I mentioned yesterday, you have about 6,000 genes. You have about 160 observational data points and 1,500 gene deletions. And so what is nice about this data set is that you have a bit knowledge about the ground truth, right? So here, for example, you see these two genes, 4,710 and 5,954. And this is the observational uh, data. So these are the 160 observational data points. And now, out of these 1,500 gene deletions, you have one data point where you deleted this gene, the 5,954. So you deleted this, so the activity goes down. That is good. So this means that the biologist probably did the correct experiment. And here, at the same time, you see that the activity of this gene also drops down. What does it mean? It means that this gene must have a causal effect on this one. So this is a ground truth that you can use to validate your method. So now the game we are playing goes as follows. We are sort of from these data points, um, we are using those data points as sort of a second environment. We are saying this is the first environment, this is the second environment, and then we are trying to find sort of causal pairs uh, among these 6,000 genes. And if we are now, for example, looking for sort of this gene here, this, if this is our target gene, and we want to find out whether this gene is causal or not, of course, we are not allowed to cheat, so we have to hide this data point. So you have to be a bit careful to make it uh, sort of a fair comparison, but this is what you can do. So in a way, this is environment one, this is environment two, and you're trying to find out causal pairs here. Specific interventions you're grouping as one environment? Yes, and this is a bit, uh, sounds like a weird thing to do, but you're allowed to do that. Uh, so whenever you, are, you have environments, you can actually do whatever you like. So you can group them, you can also split them. And the, this also shows that this is a nice feature, I would say, because imagine that you would treat each of these data points as one environment. Then, of course, you have like a lot of environments, but they only all have one data point. So you have no statistical power to reject any tests. So there's a trade-off between sort of splitting the environments in order to sort of have a lot of diversity in your data and grouping them where you have a lot of data points per environment so you get statistical power for the test. But this is something we didn't exploit. I think one could try uh, to do it, but we never did. I mean, we just ran it with this uh, as one environment. Yeah. So we are really grouping here. This is a good point. So we are, we are, we are sort of collecting a lot of different uh, environments into one big one. Distribution of one of whatever four seven one zero, yeah, on on some other uh, candidate in all uh, perturbations except the ones that touch that one specifically. For example, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, the, one more one more word about the the conditioning here. So if this is the same model in environment one, two, three, four, up to one thousand five hundred, of course it's also the same model if I group the 1 to 700 and then the 700 to 1,500, right? It's the same thing. So, I mean, whenever this null hypothesis is satisfied for the, correct, for the causal parents, uh, then you can group as, as much as you like. You have to be a bit careful here again. So whenever you're looking for causes, but this is a detail, I think, but whenever you're looking for causes for 4,710, of course, you're like um, not using this one, but then has to be a bit careful, actually. So what, what, how we did it is, Whenever, so you are hiding this data point where you intervened on this guy, and then you are running through all the possible genes and trying to see whether in one of these uh, sets this guy showed up as a possible cause, and then you could, ch could check is it really a cause or not. So this was a long, t you have to do like, you're running through a lot of different possibilities. Uh, it takes quite some time, but there are a couple of tricks to speed it up. Anyhow, so this is, this is what you can do, and this is what uh, we found out. Also tells you that, um, so there seems to be some signal, but it's not like uh, we are at the end of the story. So there are a lot of uh, things to work on uh, still. So this, what, you, what do you see here? So on the x-axis, you see the number of um, sort of causal pairs that you predict. So you're saying the first one, for example, is a pair that says, aha, so I believe gene number 17 is really causing gene number 120. So this is the most significant pair. So this is the... Uh, the case where the method is most certain about. So then it's an ROC type curve. So then when you make a, when it's correct, when this pair is indeed causal, then you go up one step. 
So then you take the next uh, significant pair, and again, you check is it correct or not, and if it is, you go up. So this means that this identical line, this is the perfect thing. So better, this is sort of the, um, this is as good as it gets. So this means that all of your predictions are correct. So here the gray bar is sort of something that you, um, uh, you expect if you just guess randomly. So this is a 99% uh, prediction interval. So if you just randomly pick some uh, pairs and say, well, I believe that this is causal. And these green and orange, these are these invariant based methods. So this is something that you can try. And what you see is that, I mean, of course, they're not perfect, but it seems that there's some signal that you find and that at least some of these results uh, of the first results are correct. We were very happy to see it like this. And this is sort of the point that I would like to uh, sort of um, bring up here. If you just do regression, it just doesn't do the trick. So if you do regression, like uh, there are very various versions, of course, but this is like with the lasso. So you do a variable selection technique. So you're trying to say, okay, I'm trying to predict this gene, and I just see what are the most significant predictors. Then you're not beating random guessing. So this is the green line here. So this is where where you are at. So is it interventional data or not? Yeah, we, are, we have used both. So we either either you pool, uh, so either you pool the interventional and observational, or you use only observational, or you use only interventional. Doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Is the red one penalizing for number of participants? Why the, does it get to that? Uh, <laughs> See, but, but we never. But I, I should actually check this, the p-values. I never did. But that's a good point. So at some point, of course, um, what you will find is that you you end up including uh, cases where you're not certain about, right? Because imagine that you get. We are just sorting them. Actually, that's a good comment. I'm not sure why we why didn't do it. So you are sorting these pairs. So what you will find is that you get these p-values, right? And imagine that you have that the set 1, 2, or like 1, 7, this is um, a very good set, but let's say 2, 8 is also a reasonably good set. So this uh, leads to a p-value of 0.03, and this leads to a p-value of 0.07, for example. So then what you would find is that this guy, this is now a complicated statement, but this variable 2, uh, if you want to create a p-value for this, I didn't explain it, but if you want to get a p-value for this variable, what you do is you look at the best set that does not contain 2. In this case, it would be this one, so you get a p-value of 0.03. Which means that uh, intuitively this is uh, the right thing to do, because if you now look at all other sets and they all have a p-value of 10 to the minus 6, this means, aha, if you want to find an invariant model, you really need to include 2. So this gives you an idea of a scaling. But if there's a set that is almost invariant as well, maybe you want to have a high p-value. So what happens is that at some point, you're including variables or you're proposing causal effects that are, you are really not certain about. And I only, so I remember, this was some time ago, but I remember that the first ones, they were very significant, and then it drops down. But I should have a look where it drops down, because this I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. On base of the total graph, so what's your, your max, maximum number of interventions that you could Ah, the maximum number of causes. Yeah, this is, is the same question, no? I mean, at some point, and again, I'm not cheating here, I just forgot to do it. At some point, you do not want to predict anything anymore. Is the, if the p-value here is larger than 0.05, it's useless to do something. No, this is real data. Oh, this is yeah. real data. So how do, you, how do you, oh, OK, so basically the strong intervention effects are the ones that you can see. Uh, it, yeah, no, the, so this is um, this is what we predict, right? So the, this means okay, we are. I guess so. The first point on this axis is I say I guess one is causing seven, and then you say it's correct if it's a, what we call a strong intervention effect, and basically this we determine by using these interventions. So we are saying first we check is the intervention here correct. So in most of the cases it is, and then we are saying this gene has an, an effect on this gene if this data point lies uh, like below all the other points. Yes, yeah, you have to be very careful to do that. So that's what I try to, but uh, yeah, yeah, because otherwise it would be cheating. There is a lot of information in this. Yeah. You have to hold them out. Yeah. The number of true interactions found by the the number of the number of true interactions found by the. Yeah, um, roughly 0.1% of the pairs. Which is 1,500 by 6,000? 
Uh, but no, which is 0.1% of 6,000 times 6,000, I think. Ah, uh, no, no, you're right. Yeah, sorry, you're right. It's, uh, you're right. It's 0.1% so like, of this times this. Yeah. It's like 10,000, then you found about 10,000. Um, yeah, yeah, so we are, we are finding very few of those. Yeah, that's correct. So in many cases, I mean, this is also what, uh, what I said, you have to sort of, it's not, there's a lot of room for improvement. So we are not saying we are solving this problem. What we are saying is this method is not built for finding all the causal effects. It's built for saying, it's built for this coverage guarantee. So it's, it's meant to say that whenever the method outputs something, we hope that it's correct. And I, I fully agree. So we are not, I mean, this method is really not suited well for finding all of them. It's only the, what our hope was to say, we want to create this list for the practitioners and we want to be at a good list. This, would be our, this was our goal. <laughs> so we want to say that the top genes are hopefully good candidates. Does this answer the question? But I mean, this, I mean if, if you would find something that goes up until 10,000, I mean, uh, the community would uh, give you a prize. <laughs> that would be amazing, yeah. Good, I think I'm again uh, running over time. So with this, um, let's conclude here. What's coming like in the afternoon, um, uh, I will try to argue where you can use these causal ideas in machine learning as well. So thanks for your attention.